This man, uh, reckoned by many to be the world's best heart surgeon, and he's held the hearts of over 11,000 patients in his hands. But when it comes to life in the operating table, how does he cope with that responsibility, with that pressure? Well, Professor Steve Westerby um, has told a lot of his stories in his book. This is The Knife's Edge. Um, it's absolutely fascinating um, and we're delighted that he's with us today. And um, you're a very modest man, I know that, but a lot of people have called you the world's best heart surgeon. How many years have you been doing this? I did heart surgery for almost 40 years from beginning training. And let me say I'm very embarrassed about the headline because... Uh, I've been through the great I am stage, like all young heart surgeons, but, um, as you say, I'm quite modest now. You're very but... modest, um, and I think between eleven and 12,000 surgeries you've yeah. performed. How many lives have you saved in that time? I, I hope the great majority. I mean, uh, if, if you work in heart surgery, particularly when I, I started in the, the 1970s, the, the mortality was substantial. So that was one thing that we had to get to grips with. Um, I, I, I guess you lo lose. Um, it probably. isn't my phone. No, it's not my phone. I suspect it's your. Oh gosh, if it is, <laughs> is I'll it get your killed. Phone? Well, <laughs> yours <laughs> makes a See, this like is that. the problem with phones, yeah, isn't it? Mine's mine. on silent. Not mine. Mine's on silent. Maybe sure? it's our iPad. Well, anyway, you know the, mm. the, the, the trouble is, doctors can never switch their phones off. Yeah, no, of course. But you know, Ruth. Ruth was talking there about. Um, the the fantastic things you do, um, and if you're anything, you know, like a lot of us, um, you don't remember the great things you do. You remember the bad things yeah. you do. So saving life is, is one thing, but yeah. then to lose one, what is what is that? If like? if I operated on more than eleven thousand patients, I lost at least three to four hundred over thirty years, and. I, I honestly couldn't say I remember every one, but there, there were many that stuck out in my mind. If you're a heart surgeon, you, you're doing it because you want to make people's lives better and you want to save lives. But people with heart disease, uh, a lot of them come in desperately sick. And you can either say, that patient's too sick, I'm not going to try, or you can take them on and do your best. And when, when you take that approach, some will die. It happens that the relatives always are grateful uh, for you trying. You tried. Um, so it's something you have to walk away from. How does that affect you psychologically? How do you then go about your day, the next day's surgery, um, without that preying on your mind? The next case in the afternoon, I have to say. You, you simply have to uh, go and tell the relatives that things... Uh, often what we used to say is the operation went swimmingly well, but I'm, I'm sorry, uh, your loved one died. Uh, and then you turn around and you have to walk away and focus on the next patient. Um, uh, what I did latterly after I retired was remember things. Uh, and that's why I wrote the book. Because uh, when the government started to publish surgeons' death rates... I decided that that was not a good thing because it, it makes surgeons defensive. Yeah. They, they don't want to do the high-risk cases when that happens. Uh, so I wanted to tell the story from the other side, which is what The Knife's Edge really is about. And your story is absolutely fascinating mm. because if I'd have had to guess, I'd have thought you were probably from a, a middle-class family, went to a grammar school, yeah. uh, you know, university, and it's completely yeah. the opposite to I, that. Yeah, I, I started out on a council estate in Scunthorpe, uh, which I'm very proud of, um, and I had to work hard, but there were, there were particular things that pointed me in the direction of wanting to be a heart surgeon. Uh, I lived across the road from my grandfather, as families used to live close together in the old days. He suffered heart attack after heart attack, and I watched him sink into severe heart failure, uh, and eventually I was there when he died of heart failure. Uh, and as a seven-year-old boy, I was struck by how miserable that was. And a couple of weeks later, on a tiny nine-inch black-and-white television uh, set, I saw a programme called Your Life in Their Hands. Mm. And it just talked about how the Americans were building a heart-lung machine. And one day we would be able to operate meaningfully inside the heart. Uh, and I was gripped by that. And at the age of seven, I, I said, I'm going to be a heart surgeon. Taking that further and that very noble dream and ambition and your insight into what seemed to be 
you know, just such futuristic technology there on that black and white screen. Can you foresee the day when people like yourself will be replaced by artificial intelligence, by robots? No, I don't think so, but we already use robots. Uh, the surgeon has to govern the robot and tell it what to do, but what robotics allows is operations on the heart uh, and on various other parts of the body, but through much smaller holes so that patients get better quicker. But with the heart, you have to stop it. Uh, you have to stop it and open it, and you can only do that if you put a patient on this machine where blood leaves the body, goes into a pump, uh, into what we call the oxygenator to swap uh, carbon dioxide for oxygen, put it back into the patient. And when I started out in heart surgery, you could do a perfectly satisfactory, accurate operation that should make a patient better. But in the smallest of children and the sickest of adults, mm. simply going on to the heart-lung machine uh, used to cause the patient to die. And what we worked out was that the blood was responding to the foreign surfaces of the heart-lung machine. Uh, well, you say we worked out, you worked out. From what I was reading, this is yeah. you being very modest again, you put hours and hours and hours of research into this to determine to find yeah. out why this was I, happening. I, when I was training in America, I, I actually found out what the material was that was prompting this whole body inflammatory response that damaged the lungs, damaged the kidneys, damaged the brain. And by sitting up at night in a laboratory with a test tube of blood and putting nylon and polyethylene in, we actually found what material was most damaging. And that was when I was a very young man, but we told the companies that made the materials of the heart-lung machine what the problem was. They took those materials out and the whole of heart surgery became safer. And, and that was probably a far bigger contribution. Well, for that alone, Amazing. you should... Yeah be given a knighthood or, or something like that. Oh, we mustn't talk about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Professor, let me, let me ask you this. Um, if you were to perform surgery on the NHS, uh, could you save it? And if so, what would that, what would that surgery be? You know, the, the NHS is full of fantastic uh, doctors, surgeons, nurses, physiotherapists. We're well trained and we're very good, but right now there are not enough. And that's why we see so many people coming in from abroad to work. And I don't think we should take the best people from Asia and Africa. I, we're depriving them. So I think we need more doctors and nurses. And right now, the worst thing about the NHS, which I've supported for my whole career, is simply access to treatment. And a, a recent European study put the NHS as 35th out of 36 countries in terms of access to treatment. So you wait to see a GP, you wait for your investigations, you wait to see a surgeon, you wait for an operation, and all of those things make your outlook worse. But you, the only way to remedy that, I presume, is money. Is, is, is money, more scanners, more staff, um, and I, th I think we've simply just got to get to grips with it. Um, Why do less doctors now in this country want to train to, be, to do what you did? You've hit the nail on the head. Um, there's been a whole series of hospital scandals, whether it be Bristol and Children's Heart, Stafford and so on, and it, it has put young people off working at the sharp end, being surgeons. Um, putting surgeons' death rates into the public arena, as I say, makes them very defensive. But it also says, uh, perhaps this is not the sort of uh, medicine that I want to go into. Is that because, I mean, so as you say, your, your track record is put on display there. People, you may think, well, I don't want to go to that doctor because he's got a high mortality rate. But there are very many reasons why people die, I suppose. I, I always maintained, and I wrote, and I went up against the government with this, um, that the best surgeons tend to have the highest mortality rates because they take on the sickest patients, and that's rather obvious. But it's very interesting. Just in the last couple of months, uh, I, I was called to Japan 
because the Japanese surgeons are threatened with the same thing. Uh, and just yesterday, I, I've been asked to go to the United States to talk at their big surgeons meeting about the disadvantages of putting the spot, spotlight on surgeons. And there's a reason. If you're stressed, if, if you're stressed in, in the programme, if my phone pings, it's a source <laughs> of annoyance to you. But your, we'll blood, you <laughs> your blood cortisol levels go up when you're stressed. And very smart research in Cambridge University showed that elevated levels of blood cortisol from the adrenal glands during stress make you risk-averse uh, involuntarily. So when surgeons say, mm, I'd rather not operate on you, I'm worried about what might happen, it's not they're been bloody-minded. Mm. It's an automatic response, which was picked up in financial traders in the city. Well, I've been picked up with that as well. Right. Uh, through doing live television. Yeah. Yeah, it makes me risk at first. Yeah. Well, <laughs> chronically, if you're in a stressful position, having to interview people like me, then uh, your cortisol levels will go up yeah. uh, by about 70%, and you won't want to... You won't want to do certain things. Well, we well, can talk to you all day, Doctor, but we're going to hear We could talk to you all viewers. day, but there's so many people getting in touch. Um, and one in particular I wanted to read to you, Dana, said, Mr Westerby saved my life and my baby. Valve replacement surgery five weeks after I had my baby prematurely and a balloon put in my valve while I was pregnant. What a great man. Haley said, Professor Westerby did my son's open heart surgery back in 2007. Thank you. And that's just one of many. Um, it's in the, the Knife's Edge it is an absolutely fascinating read. What a fascinating story and what an amazing You're man you kind. are. You're very kind. I appreciate no, it. No, it's fascinating really to, to hear and see what you do. And <laughs> This man talks about his hands, he talks about the procedures that, that is involved. It's, it's just amazing. It's there. Thank you very much, Professor. An honour to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.